Hello, and welcome to the first of three lectures on endocrinology. I'm Colin Diane, Professor of Clinical Diabetes and Metabolism at Cardiff University School of Medicine. Let's have a look at the first question. A 27-year-old woman presents to the clinic because of problems with the physical side of her relationship. She's concerned that her breasts leak milk after only, minim only minimal stimulation from her boyfriend and that intercourse is difficult as she has significant problems with vaginal dryness. She also reports that she's not had a period for the past four months. The only other history of note is that she was given metoclopramide by a locum doctor for a recent episode of gastroenteritis. On examination, her blood pressure is 142 over 82, pulse is 82, and cardiovascular respiratory and abdominal examination is unremarkable. You can produce milk on minimal breast stimulation. She has some peripheral field visual loss. Here are the investigations. I'll give you a moment just to have a little look at those. And here's the question. Which one of the following is the most likely diagnosis? And I'll give you a moment to look at the five options there. So the correct answer is a non-functioning pituitary adenoma. How did we come to that conclusion? Well, if we go back to the investigations, what you should have noticed is that the prolactin is raised, but not very raised, 1,005. She also has a slightly raised TSH, uh, but a normal free T4. And if you look at her FSH and LH, they are not raised, they're on the low side. All of those findings are consistent with a raised prolactin level, suppressing her FSH and LH. And of course, the clinical symptoms that she's presenting with are those of a low estrogen level. She hasn't had a period and she's got vaginal dryness and problems with intercourse. So we have a raised prolactin to explain. If we go back to the answers, what, what is the best answer of those? Well, pregnancy is a possibility and something we always should bear in mind, but it shouldn't have symptoms of low estrogen level. So that seems unlikely. It could be related to methoclopramide, but that was quite a long time ago, and it's likely that the methoclopramide will have worn off at this point in time. Now, what about a micro or macro prolactinoma? And the point in the history that was particularly important is the peripheral visual field loss. And they would only put something in the question if it was relevant, particularly in the MRCP part two. So that makes a micro prolactinoma unlikely. It would produce a level of prolactin as you've seen, but it wouldn't be affecting the optic chiasm and affecting the visual fields. So we've got a macro prolactinoma or a non-functioning pituitary tumor that could be large enough to press on the visual fields. Now the size of a prolactinoma determines the level of prolactin. So once you have a tumor that's a macro prolactinoma, it will be producing well over a thousand uh, uh, level of prolactin. In fact, typically around 10,000, once it's well out of the cell and more than one centimeter across, probably 20, 30, 40, or 50,000. So that makes it unlikely that this is a macro prolactinoma and leads us to answer A, the non-functioning pituitary adenoma, which is producing prolactin by pressing on the pituitary stalk and producing, if you like, a disconnection effect. Let's review some of that. So first of all, let's just think about prolactin and galactorrhea. It's important to remember that they are linked. So if a patient has galactorrhea and you're sure that it is milk from the breasts, then this is likely to be associated with a raised prolactin. Prolactin is not related to gynecomastia, but it is related to galactorrhea. The second thing to bear in mind that even modest levels of hyperprolactinemia will cause symptoms, will cause amenorrhea, they'll suppress the gonadotrophins and cause a secondary amenorrhea. So even levels of prolactin of seven or 800 may be sufficient to stop periods in menstruating women. Now we need to think about the causes of raised prolactin. So of course drugs are important, and you'll remember that dopamine inhibits prolactin release from the pituitary. The dopamine is coming from the hypothalamus. So anything that blocks dopamine and its action on the pituitary will cause a raised prolactin. And that's typically the antiemetics, such as the metoclopramide, or the antipsychotics, but not actually antidepressants. Marked hypothyroidism 
can also cause a raised prolactin because of the action of TRH. So you might have thought that would be the case in this lady where there was a raised TSH, but you have to be quite profoundly hypothyroid to drive enough TRH to stimulate prolactin from the pituitary, and that's what makes this unlikely in this case. So we have prolactinoma, and we discussed that a microprolactinoma is small, produces a low level of prolactin, and a macroprolactinoma will produce a very high level of prolactin. The important point here is pituitary stalk compression, that anything compressing the pituitary stalk, typically a non-functioning pituitary adenoma that is threatening her vision, can cause a slightly raised per level of prolactin, but enough to produce symptoms. A catch is macroprolactin. And this is where you see raised levels of prolactin, but the patient is asymptomatic. It's an it's a asymptomatic finding. And this is due to antibodies to prolactin that affect the assay, but in fact the prolactin is not biologically active. So we usually say that if you confirm a raised prolactin with symptoms, everybody should have an MRI scan. And the reason is you're trying to determine whether this is a macroprolactinoma that fits with the level of prolactin, or the tumour is out of proportion and suggesting a non-functioning pituitary tumour that might need surgery to protect the visual, uh, the visual tract, the optic chiasm. A final point to bear in mind is that occasionally with very large tumours, you get a very low prolactin. And this is a so-called hook effect, where the level of prolactin overwhelms the assay and you get an inappropriately low level of prolactin. If you're concerned about that, you need to ask your biochemist. Question two. A 67-year-old man with a history of chronic cough comes to the emergency department with severe vomiting and dehydration. His relatives tell you that he suffered from the cough for over three months and has progressively lost weight. He also smokes 40 to 50 cigarettes per day. On examination, he looks unwell and has a BMI of 18 with a blood pressure of 95 over 70 and a pulse of 75 per minute. There are coarse crackles on auscultation of both lung fields. Now here are the investigations. I'll give you a moment just to have a look at those. And now on to the question. Which one of the following is the most likely diagnosis? And I'll give you a moment just to have a look at the five answers. And the best answer is adrenal metastases. How did we get to that answer? Let's look back at the question. So we notice that he's got a chronic cough and that he's a smoker and that he's got a low blood pressure. And when we look at the investigations, we see a low sodium and a normal potassium and a slightly raised creatinine. He's got a hyla mass and already I'm sure you're thinking about malignancy. So now when we look at the possible answers, We've got the possibility of acute tubular necrosis, which would give the raised creatinine, normally a raised potassium, possibly a low sodium, but it doesn't take into account the malignancy. Gastroenteritis is also a possibility, but again, it doesn't take into account the malignant features. What about the paraneoplastic syndrome? Well, the common paraneoplastic syndromes are a raised calcium from PTHRP or bone metastases. Doesn't seem relevant. SIADH would cause a low sodium, but wouldn't cause hypotension. And the other possibility is a Cushing's kind of syndrome with overproduction of steroid, and that wouldn't cause a low blood pressure either. The low blood pressure associated with the low sodium is making us think of adrenal failure. So we could think of autoimmune adrenal failure, but again, that doesn't take the cancer situation into account. And that leads us to think about adrenal metastases. So I want to think for a moment about causes of hyponatremia, which of course is a very common medical problem, and a lot of people find a lot of difficulty in thinking through the possible causes. So when you're thinking about hyponatremia, the first thing is to confirm whether it truly is hyponatremia and not pseudo-hyponatremia. So if the sodium level is low, the serum osmolality should also be low. If it's not low, there's something else in there, such as a raised glucose or triglycerides or protein. If the osmolality is low and the sodium is low, this is a true low sodium. Now, if edema is present, then they're clearly not lacking in salt, 
There's in fact salt overload, and this points to cardiac, renal, or hepatic failure, which should be managed in their own right. The complicated situation is when there is no edema. And here we usually divide this into three groups. And the urine sodium is actually more useful than the use urine osmolarity in this situation. We need also to try and assess what the volume status of the patient is. So if the patient is hypovolemic, as you'll see from the left-hand column, and the urine has sodium in it, the urine sodium is more than 20, that's unusual, they should be retaining sodium. Something is putting sodium into the urine, which could be a diuretic, it could be a rare salt-losing nephropathy, but the most important condition to remember is hypoadrenalism, as untreated this could result in the death of the patient. If there is no sodium in the urine, then the patient sounds as if they're sodium depleted, they're losing sodium from somewhere else, probably from diarrhea or loss of other body fluids. If the patient is uvolemic with a normal blood pressure, then the two conditions with a low sodium and now with sodium in the urine, suggesting and confirming that the patient isn't body sodium depleted, are most commonly syndrome of inappropriate ADH, SIADH, or hypothyroidism, and you can exclude that with thyroid function. So it's important to remember that hypovolemia with hyponatremia should make you exclude hypoadrenalism. It's relatively rare, but if you miss it, uh, then the patient might die as a result of being untreated. Now we just need to think for a moment about causes of primary hypoadrenalism, of adrenal failure. Now by far and away, the commonest is going to be autoimmune, what is now referred to as Addison's disease, autoimmune Addison's disease. And that'll have positive antibodies in many cases to the adrenal glands. Of course, we need to think about steroid withdrawal, although technically this is not hypo, primary hypoadrenalism, it's an effect via the pituitary gland. Drugs can also affect the metabolism of steroids, such as rifampicin or ketoconazole. And you can have if infections which affect the adrenal gland, infect the area of the adrenal gland, particularly tuberculosis or histoplasmosis, but also HIV. And in fact, the original description of Addison's disease was in patients with tuberculosis. But there can also be masses in the adrenal glands, which as we've seen here can be metastases. Now, although this has caused adrenal failure in this case, actually metastases to the adrenal glands are quite common, and mostly they do not cause adrenal failure, but they can in some cases. And then the other aspect to think about is adrenal hemorrhage, which happens in patients, for example, on warfarin. Uh, and that's apparent on a CT or MRI scan. And a rare condition worth bearing in mind is adrenal leukodystrophy. So in a male with adrenal failure, it's worth bearing this condition in mind as it can result in neurological complications if the diagnosis is not made. Let's go on to question three. A 32-year-old woman who's known to have autoimmune hypothyroidism and who takes thyroxine replacement presents with nausea, vomiting, and lethargy. Medication of note includes thyroxine and the oral contraceptive pill. On examination, her blood pressure is 110 over 70 with a pulse of 70 per minute, but she has a postural drop of 20 millimeters of mercury on standing and her pulse increases by 10 beats per minute when she stands. She has areas of vitiligo on her skin on examination. Now here are her investigations. Let's take a moment just to look at these. Let's go on to the question. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? Autoimmune polyglandular syndrome type one, autoimmune polyglandular syndrome type two, gastroenteritis, new onset Addison's disease, and pernicious anemia. And remember, we're looking for the best answer. I'll give you a moment just to think of the, the options. And the best answer is considered to be autoimmune polyglandular syndrome type 2. Again, let's go back to the case and see how we got to that answer. So we've got a young woman here, and she's got a lot of autoimmunity, organ-specific autoimmunity, autoimmune hypothyroidism, and she's also got vitiligo. So that's making you think of autoimmune endocrine disease. She's got a postural drop, and that makes you think of adrenal failure. She's already on thyroxine. It's not going to be related to thyroid hormone, and that doesn't usually give you a postural drop anyway. So you're, you're already thinking about adrenal failure. When you look at the investigations, you see a low sodium, which would fit with adrenal failure, 
possibly some dehydration with the raised creatinine. And you were probably hoping for a raised potassium. Well, it doesn't always happen, and the potassium is towards the upper limit of normal. But if the potassium had been raised, that would have fitted as well. So when you came to the question, you might thought of new onset Addison's disease. But remember, she's already got autoimmune thyroid disease and vitiligo as well. Could it be pernicious anemia? Well, that really doesn't explain anything, although she could have pernicious anemia as well. Gastroenteritis? Well, yes, but it doesn't really explain enough of the hypotension in relation to her nausea and vomiting. So we're left with the two autoimmune polyglandular syndromes, and we need to distinguish between the two. Why do we choose type 2? Let's look at the autoimmune polyglandular syndromes. And there are two. Autoimmune polyglandular syndrome type 1. And this is the rare version. The gene is defined. It's the air gene which controls expression of these antigens in the thymus. And when it's abnormal, you get multiple autoimmune syndromes. Now this is rare. It occurs in children predominantly. So in adult practice, you don't tend to see this very much. And it begins with mucocutaneous candidiasis from a young age. So that's affecting the nails. Uh, the oropharynx and so forth. And then hypoparathyroidism, but in this case autoimmune hypoparathyroidism, which is relatively rare. Then hypoadrenalism, and then you can get other autoimmune endocrine syndromes, hypothyroidism, type 1 diabetes, etc. Much more common, and not with a single defined gene, is APS type 2. It used to be called Schmidt syndrome when it was the combination of hypothyroidism and hypoadrenalism. But actually you can get multiple autoimmune syndromes happening together. You'll notice in the list there that we don't have hypoparathyroidism, that's very rare, and we don't have the mucocutaneous candidiasis. So that's lead us to the diagnosis of APS type 2. Let's move on to question 4. A 25-year-old man attends the clinic with his partner as they're having difficulties with fertility, having tried for a baby for over 18 months with no success. Well, he does admit to decreased libido and some problems maintaining his erection. He also has had difficulties with his sense of smell for as long as he can remember. On examination, blood pressure is 120 over 70 with a pulse of 75 per minute. He has a small penis and sparse secondary sexual hair. Here are his investigations. I'll let you look at these for a moment. And then on to the answers. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? And have a look down this list of five. So the best answer here is Kalman's syndrome or Kalman syndrome. Let's go back to the question and see how we came up with that answer. So if we look at the history now, what are the key points here? So we have an individual with hypogonadism, so problems with erection and also problems with libido as well. Nothing particular of note on physical examination, but in the history is a lack of sense of smell. And as you know, in MRCP part two questions, everything could be relevant. He's got relatively underdeveloped secondary sexual characteristics with a small penis and sparse secondary sexual hair. Then when we come on to the investigations, what should have caught your eye is the low-ish testosterone. It's not very low, but it is slightly low, in association with the gonadotrophins, FSH and LH, that are not raised. If anything, they're either normal or low normal. So then that brings us on to the possible answers. In primary gonadal failure, that means the testicles are the source of the problem, the pituitary and hypothalamus will be normal and you'll get a raised LH and FSH. So mumps or chitis affects the testicles, that wouldn't cause a normal or lowish LH and FSH. And Kleinfelter syndrome also affects testicular development, so that would be also be associated with a high LH and FSH. So we're thinking potentially about pituitary failure, but remember the lack of sense of smell that points us towards Kalman syndrome, which involves the hypothalamus. In testicular feminization, uh, usually that's an androgen receptor defect. The patient is phenotypically female, so wouldn't present in this way. 
That brings us to Kalman syndrome. So we need to think for a moment about primary and secondary gonadal failure, and in this case, we're thinking about it in males. Primary gonadal failure, we said a raise, LH, and FSH. What are the common causes? By far and away, probably the commonest cause is Kleinfelter syndrome, which is the XXY uh, um, uh, chromosomal type. And these individuals have a lowish testosterone and raised LH and FSH. They could, of course, be testicular disease. Mumps or chitis is a common one. There could be cryptorchidism with failure of descent of the testes. And also an acquired cause is chemotherapy. I put in brackets testicular feminization because, as I mentioned, usually these people are phenotypically female, but XY males on genotypic testing. And their problem is that the, they have testosterone, so the testosterone, testosterone level is in fact normal, but it doesn't act, and that would be quite striking with the normal level of testosterone in a phenotypic female. What is the treatment for primary hypogonadism? Well, the answer is testosterone, which, as you know, can't usually be taken as a pill. It can be taken topically, and it can be taken intramuscularly. For secondary gonadal failure, the LH and FSH are not raised. They're not necessarily low, but they're inappropriately not raised. What about the causes? Well, pituitary or hypothalamic failure, and endocrinologists often refer to hypog, hypog, which means hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism, so a low testosterone with low or low normal LH and FSH. And if you see other pituitary deficiencies, and also perhaps a raised prolactin, which can cause hypog, hypog, then that would point towards the pituitary itself. For hypothalamic disease, the key and relatively common condition is Kalman syndrome, in which there's underdevelopment of the GnRH neurons. They don't migrate properly into the right place, and it's associated with development of the olfactory bulbs, and that's why you often has, have anosmia. However, there are cases of Kalman syndrome or Kalman-like syndrome in which it is a hypothalamic problem, an isolated failure of GnRH, and they still have normal sense of smell. Now, typically, they fail to enter puberty, but it is possible they can get partially into puberty, which is what's happened in this case. What is the treatment? Well, if they're not looking for fertility, you can give them testosterone for any cause of secondary uh, gonadal failure. But if they actually want to get uh, uh, have children, then you need to either give gonadotrophins themselves or pulsed GnRH, which is given either intravenously or subcutaneously. But if you give testosterone, then that will essentially act as a contraceptive, but it will restore all the secondary sexual characteristics except testicular growth. Let's go on to question five. A 24-year-old man with a history of previous injury in a motorcycle accident comes to the clinic with his mother. She looks after him because he's been left with a right arm and leg weakness after a skull fracture and intracranial hemorrhage. He also has epilepsy, for which he takes carbamazepine. And they complain that he's been thirsty all the time and he can't stop drinking litres of water and squash each day. His mother herself has a significant chronic illness, suffering from chronic left ventricular failure. Now here are his investigations. I'll give you a moment just to have a look at those. And here are the questions. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? Have a look at this list of five. And the best answer here is cranial diabetes insipidus. Let's go back to the case and pick up the key points. So this is a young man with a history of head injury. That's going to be important. And he clearly has polydipsia polyuria. He's thirsty all the time. He can't stop drinking litres of water and squash each day. We're wondering about the epilepsy and the carbamazepine, which in fact turn out not to be relevant here, as is the illness of the mother, which is probably not relevant either. In the investigations, what you should have uh, identified is that the sodium is slightly high. It's certainly not low. Potassium is within the normal range. Creatinine is slightly high, suggesting an element of dehydration. And the plasma osmolality is strikingly high. Normally, it would not be above 290. And this is associated with a low urine osmolality. Now, the thing to remember is, in normal functioning, the blood should be like the urine. 
So if you have a concentrated blood, you should have a concentrated urine to hold on to water to correct the problem. And if you've got a dilute blood, you should have dilute urine trying to get rid of water. Here we've got concentrated blood and dilute urine. That's the wrong way around. There's a problem here. And then we're told something about DDAVP. And what we see is that the urine is dilute, less than 300, and after giving DDAVP, there's a very prompt concentration, so it rises to 810. That's a very good response. That's telling us that the kidney is functioning well. So if we look at the options here, what about SIADH? Well, that's water excess, and you'd see a low sodium in that situation. That's not going to be the correct answer. Could it be nephrogenic diabetes insipidus? Well, that would give you polydipsy polyuria, but you wouldn't get a response to DDAVP because the kidney would be the site of the problem. Could it be diuretic abuse? And that is possible, but again, normally you'd end up with a low sodium with diuretic abuse, and here you've got a relatively high sodium because of dehydration. And what about psychogenic polydipsia? And usually this is the tricky one to separate from diabetes insipidus. But in psychogenic polydipsia, they're water loaded. And again, the sodium level would be low. So that points us in the direction of cranial diabetes insipidus. It fits with the head injury and fits with the response to DDAVP. It's worth thinking for a moment about causes of polydipsia polyuria. And there are six main causes. Diabetes mellitus, which of course is the commonest reason, and of course we'll have a raised glucose. You can't have polydipsia polyuria from, from diabetes mellitus without glucose in the urine and a significantly raised level above 10. Diabetes insipidus, we've just talked about, that's associated with dehydration, so the sodium level would be raised. Chronic renal failure is essentially a form of nephrogenic diabetes insipidus because the kidney's not responding. That normally would have a raised creatinine. And you can get an acquired diabetes insipidus, nephrogenic that is, from a high calcium, hypercalcemia, or a low potassium, hypokalemia. And the final cause there is primary polydipsia. And again, that can be quite a difficult diagnosis to make, but the clue is a low sodium and a hypoosmolar plasma instead of a concentrated plasma. And again, there isn't a raised glucose, there isn't a raised creatinine, and there's normal calcium and potassium. What about diabetes insipidus? Just a couple of points here. So I was reminding you that the plasma is concentrated, but the urine is dilute. That's typical for diabetes insipidus, both nephrogenic and cranial. In cranial diabetes insipidus, the damage has to be in the hypothalamus. It can't just be in the pituitary because you can release uh, AVP or ADH, they're the same thing, directly from the hypothalamus. So the kind of causes are trauma, as we saw in this case, or surgery after pituitary surgery, if they've damaged the hypothalamus, or a tumor that arises in the hypothalamus, such as craniopharyngioma. Not a typical pituitary tumor unless they've, they've operated on it. And of course, it, the kidney will respond to DDAVP in this situation, and that is the treatment. In nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, you can get it as a primary condition, uh, particularly in children, where the AVP receptor is non-functioning. Or, as we've seen, secondary to high calcium, low potassium, renal disease or drugs such as lithium, and it does not respond to DDAVP. Thank you for watching this lecture. Uh, hopefully you found it informative, and I hope you'll be able to watch the next lecture uh, on endocrinology. Mm -hmm.